time now for Back Pages tonight here on Sky Sports News, bringing you a first look at the sports stories in the morning's newspapers. Joining us on the show are the football editor at The Sun, Charlie Wyatt, and the Times chief sports reporter, Martin Ziegler. Well, let's have a quick look through some of the headlines. In the mail, not again. Hudson Smith pipped to gold on the line by USA, just like her. And another article, help us stop the riots. Number 10, begs a nation's football club to help. In the eye, a similar headline, not again. Hudson Smith hit by American the day after it happened to Kerr. And an interesting one here, Pochettino open to the England job. In the Guardian, put on alert, sports bodies hold talks with government over unrest and GB suffer. Another gold heist. Okay, let's start with that 400 metre final. Charlie, we'll come to you first. Quincy Hall seemed to come out of nowhere, didn't he? You've got a feel for Hudson Smith, don't you? Extraordinary race, yeah. And, and at the end of the race, the camera panned in and, and he just, you could quite clearly see that he shouted the F word and he obviously knew he'd been quick. He smashed his own European record and he's still been pipped on the line, as you said, you know, 24 hours after... Josh Kerr got beaten on the line by an American. It's happened again. Absolutely heartbreaking for him. You could see he was in floods of tears uh, afterwards when he spoke to the media and his parents made a surprise visit as well because he doesn't like them watching him normally. Uh, so desperately unlucky as you know, it was such a quick time. Yeah, such a quick time. And he was the fastest man in the world over this distance in 2024. Martin, can he still be proud of a silver? Well, it's one of those things, isn't it? I mean, he, he should be desperately um, proud of his performance because it was it was a sensational time and it was almost the perfect race. It's just one of those things that somebody who just had that little bit left in the tank just got there at the last minute. I think you could just see him, like the strength draining out of Hudson Smith's legs as he was getting to close to the line and then Quincy Hall just managed to come through you know, astonishing times, you know, very few people have, have, have beaten those times ever. Um, so, so Hudson Smith, will, he'll, you know, he's 29 now. He'll look back on this, perhaps thinking this was his, his last chance of getting Olympic glory, but um, as an individual anyway. But it's, um, I think when he, you know, years to come, perhaps he'll think he did, he did himself proud and did the country proud. And unfortunately, Charlie, deja vu of yesterday. And what happened with Josh Kerr? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, there, there were two, you know, brilliant races, weren't they? And again, you know, Josh, Josh, Josh Kerr just just did everything, didn't he? Um, so, yeah, re re really similar. But, but equally, as Martin said, although both these guys are, are winners and they would have felt they could win, would have almost expected to win, um, a, you know, a, a silver at the Olympics is obviously an extraordinary achievement and uh, in time they will obviously be very proud as will uh, everyone involved with the Team GB Athletics team. Martin, how hard to bounce back from a disappointment like this on, on the biggest stage, really? Well, you know, I think you give it your all, don't you? When, when, you know, you, you're building up for it for, for so long um, and for Hudson, Hudson Smith particularly it's been sort of basically eight years isn't it of building up to this moment so it, it, it is going to be it is difficult but um you know athletes they you know they, they, they live and die by the sword and they have to sort of pick themselves up and, and get on with it i mean you're right you're mentioning josh kerr being pipped again i mean it, it Team GB had, had a great, you know great start uh in, and they got getting lots and lots of medals but the, the gold medal seems to be particularly elusive. And you look at the medal table, Australia have won fewer medals overall, but they, they're higher in the medal table because they've got something like 17 golds to, to GB's 12. So um, I'm sure as the, the, the last days of the Olympics come out, there'll be people will be desperately trying to get those gold medals rather than be pipped again on the, at the post. Right, OK, well, let's move on now to speak about a story that we're seeing across the papers tonight, and that is that football is being asked to do its bit to help the unrest 
around the country. Obviously, scenes we absolutely do not want to see. The Guardian have gone with put on alert. Sports bodies hold talks with government over unrest. And then in the mail as well, they've said, help us stop the riots. Number 10 begs the nation's football club. So with the championship back this weekend, the Premier League back next weekend, Charlie, what kind of responsibility do football clubs have here? Well, I, I mean, ultimately, it's the people themselves who have the responsibility uh, and, and to not act like idiots. And, and clearly, the, the government are concerned enough to put this Zoom call out to the sports bodies. Uh, but specifically, you know, there is intelligence that you know, some of the uh, fans from risk groups at football clubs have been involved with uh, getting people involved and going to the various towns and cities uh, to uh, take part in these marches. I think that the EFL, uh, as you mentioned, is that the, the first uh, opening weekend uh, this weekend. Um, the EFL don't want the clubs to get involved in sort of a major political issue, but equally they just want to them to stress how important it is for everyone to be together and support everyone, you know, in terms of football fans. Uh, but while it's expected that all the games will go ahead this weekend, I don't think that's a concern. I think the following week, there is a full Premier League programme that, that starts and you've got bigger crowds, potential high risk games. Uh, and if you've got another march on the day of a high risk game in any given city, that could give the police some real problems in terms of manpower and it could put those games potentially at risk. Uh, so I think it could have uh, an impact uh, on, on football over the, over the next couple of weeks if these marches continue. Yeah, absolutely, Martin. What do you think? Do you think that this strain on, on police forces could affect upcoming sports fixtures? Obviously, it's a, it's a concern. Um, I mean, the football clubs have already actually um, to put out messaging. For example, Sunderland Football Club did last week um, when there was some trouble there. And I think that, you know, that there have been talks of being going on with the football bodies and the government since then. So I think this is a progression. It's not just football. They've asked other sports to get involved too and other, and other sporting clubs. But, yeah, I think the reason that they are trying to involve football clubs is... is just to say, you know, if if you don't want our matches to be put at risk, then do not cause trouble. Uh, and they, they're hoping that the you know, the vast majority of fans are law-abiding and will, will put pressure on anyone who does try and put those matches at risk by saying, you know, don't do that. We want to, we want to go to our games. They've you know, been waiting for the start of the season. Don't put that at risk. Charlie, the article in the mail says, help us stop the riots. Number 10 begs the nation's football clubs. Do you think it's fair to put this much pressure on football clubs to solve a problem that, that maybe they can't solve? Well, I, I think it'd be, you know, it's, it'd be unfair just to suddenly start blaming uh, all the terrible scenes we've seen uh, on football fans. I, I think that's not right. But equally, the police know that uh, fans who have an allegiance with some clubs and those high-risk groups have been organising it. So it has become an issue for some football clubs, I fear, uh, which is a shame because, uh, you know, we've got to remember that most football matches, uh, pretty much all of them go off uh, trouble-free throughout the country. I thought our fans were outstanding um, in Germany. Uh, obviously, there were some banning orders uh, with some football uh, fans and maybe the, these are the people maybe uh, be involved in what's happening at the moment. But uh, I think fo football supporters um, uh, are incredibly well behaved and uh, hopefully the message will get through uh, to um, a few of the idiots who are causing uh, the problems at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, Charlie. Right, moving on to an article in The Eye, a really interesting article, this one, saying Maurizio Pochettino is open to the England job, obviously leaving Chelsea at the end of last season. Lee Carsley in interim charge. Martin, what are your thoughts on that? Is Mauricio Pochettino the right man for England? Yeah, um, I think Pochettino is, a, uh, I'm sure he is open to the job and he would like to be considered and he's a very good manager. I'm not sure a national team manager is perhaps his forte because I, I think he's the sort of head coach who Gets a, gets a team together, works with them, trains with them every day, you know, builds up them, them physically. I mean, the, the sort of stories of the sort of intensive training under Pochettino. Um, 
make that's that's how that's his sort of uh, his raison d'etre. That's how he he gets the teams playing as he wants. If you're a national team manager, you don't have that opportunity. You only have the players for a very short one of time, so you have to approach it in a different way. And I think, but for him, that would be that would be a test. I'm not saying he couldn't do it, but it's not something he's done before. So I think it would be he might be hard pushed. I think to um, achieve success as easily as a, as he has done it at his clubs. Yeah, and it's certainly not an easy job, is it, Charlie? What do you think? Do you think Mauricio Pochettino ticks the right boxes for England manager? Not really. Um, I, I, yeah, I think he's a, he's a, he's a good manager. Um, he's out of work, so the England job is obviously incredibly uh, attractive. I uh, don't know how it would go down back home in Argentina if he became England manager. I think that would be a, a, a genuine concern, actually, um, for him, um, but uh, I, th I think the FA are taking their time, quite rightly. Lee Carsley could well be uh, the interim manager against Ireland in Dublin on September the 7th. I think that'd be the right choice. I'd actually like to see Lee Carsley get the job full time, providing uh, the performances in these two matches uh, were good. I think if you're under 21's manager and looking what he achieved at the Euros under 21's last summer uh, and you know, good style of attacking football. Uh, for and he obviously knows from the younger players in the England squads. For me, Lee Carsley actually ticks more boxes than uh, Pochettino. Martin, would you agree with Charlie there? Do you think Lee Carsley ticks more boxes than Pochettino? I think he probably does. Um, uh, I mean, I think that, that probably I would still say he has a favourite, um, and maybe with Graham Potter behind. But it's you know, you, know, you never know it because. Out of Southgate, he came up through the under 21s. He was given an opportunity as a caretaker and took it. And the same thing could happen here because Eddie Howe has a has a job already. Um, the FA would have to pay compensation, quite high compensation, to get him away from Newcastle. So th th there's lots of issues to consider. Um, but yeah, I still think you know all things being yeah, Eddie Howe would be the man the FA won. It's just, but. If it doesn't happen quickly, Carsley gets that opportunity, anything can happen. Yep, anything can happen indeed. It's time now for a break. Thank you for now. But when we come back, we will look at more of the back pages, including this in The Times from Martin. It says each West Ham United home game costs London taxpayers £500,000. We'll have more on that after this break. You're watching Back Pages tonight, and welcome back to the football editor of The Sun, Charlie Wyatt, and The Times chief sports reporter, Martin Ziegler. Well, let's go to Martin's article, which is inside The Times. It's on West Ham, saying the stadium cost London taxpayers £20.9 million last year. The owners lost that amount, according to accounts, despite increased revenue by concerts and reduced costs for hosting events like athletics and MLB baseball. Martin, can you talk us through this one? Yeah, so this is um, the, the company, it's a publicly owned company, um, own E20, which owns the London Stadium. It's draft accounts uh, for the, the year ending May, May 2024 showed it lost more than £20 million. Now, that's, um, that, that, that's something which has been an ongoing issue, and, and it is being picked up in you know, the cost of the tap has to be picked up by London taxpayers. So it's an issue. I mean, West Ham have got this deal, this great deal for them. They pay 3.6 million a year in rent, and they don't have to pay any of the costs at all. They get to keep the ticket money. Um, so actually, you are you are in a position where the sort of taxpayers are having to underwrite the costs on the stadium, uh, which works out something it's hundreds of thousands of pounds for for every West Ham home match. Um, you can't blame West Ham, but it's an issue for the London mayor, who says he's not going to sell the stadium. Yeah, so Sadiq Khan has ruled out the possibility of West Ham buying the stadium for the right price. But Charlie, would this be a good solution to this problem? It's the only solution. <laughs> yeah, they have to let West Ham buy the ground and, and sort it out and make it a proper football stadium. Uh, I mean, I mean you know, another sort of fascinating part of Martin's story was the fact that he said how you know it was costing £11 million to take the seats out 
um, and then for other events. And now it's gone down to 3 million. I don't know how it's gone down by 8 million and how it was ever 11 million. But yeah, remember what Manchester City did when they had, you know, the Commonwealth Games were at the Etihad. They took, they dug down and, and they were able to put some more seats in and they should let West Ham buy that stadium, make it into a proper ground. Any fan that's been there, uh, particularly an away supporter that ends up in the upper tier there, it, you, you can't watch football. It, it's, it's not a nice experience. Um, you know, West Ham fans, most of them hate it there. Uh, they still do a pretty job, a decent job of making the atmosphere OK, actually. Uh, but it's, 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 it's such a difficult situation. I remember when Tottenham were also in for the ground uh, and Daniel Levy was ridiculed for saying he wanted to buy it, then knock it down and start again. Actually, he actually probably had the, the, the best idea. But uh, yeah, the, 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 the mayor of London, he, he needs to sort this out and just let West Ham buy that ground back. Yeah, Martin, London City owners surely can't afford to lose the same amount this year. But, but what are their options realistically? What do you think they're going to do? Well, they, they haven't got any options. I think it's, it's one of those things that are going to keep going on. I mean, they, they, they managed to in, in, improve their position by 1.2 million. But when you're facing sort of 15 to 20 million pound losses each year, that, that's a drop in the ocean. So there is no easy answer to this. Either you keep sort of propping it up, bailing it out, whatever you want to call it, or you take radical action. And that's uh, it's it's how much West Ham will be willing to pay for it because it's the actual value to the London Legacy Development Corporation, which owns it. The paper value of it is nil because it costs so much to it costs them so much to, for the upkeep. OK, right. Well, staying with stadium issues and we will go to The Telegraph, who have this story about Manchester United saying they will vow to keep Old Trafford. So Manchester United do not plan to demolish Old Trafford if they build a new stadium. Their home ground since 1910 would probably be scaled down to a capacity of about 30,000 for use by the women's team and the academy. Charlie, what are your thoughts on this? Is, is this a good idea, would you say? It sounds like a great idea, and I'm sure the majority of Manchester United fans uh, will be pleased. I think equally, most of those supporters will accept the fact that Old Trafford um, it, it's just not fit for purpose uh, in terms of one of the biggest teams in the world. Uh, I, I think there's obviously a huge amount of land next door where they could build a new stadium. One option was to knock Old Trafford down and build it on that same spot, which didn't make any sense whatsoever. But by building the ground next door, but then keeping, you know, some sort of the, the key parts of Old Trafford, Trafford with some of the statues, uh, and just reducing it down to 30, 35,000. Um, it, it's, it, it's a really good idea. It will still cost a lot of money. I mean, the stadium next door could cost up to 2 billion, and reducing this ground from, what, 75, 76,000 down to 30, 35,000 would uh, not only cost a lot of money, but would, would take a very long time uh, to, to make those changes, but I think it's the perfect solution, and I'm pretty sure United fans uh, will be uh, will have greeted this news uh, with, with delight. It, it sounds as though Ineos are, 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 are making uh, getting the, the, the big decisions right. Yeah, Martin, just an idea at this stage, though. But how likely is it? Do you think that this is going to happen? Yeah, I mean, I do, I do think there's a, there's quite a big risk attached to it. Obviously, I'm not a sort of surveyor, or, but I, if you look at the fact that, uh, I mean, you, as Charlie did reference, the fact is it's going to be time consuming and expensive to reduce it by by that. And what's it going to look like? Um, and if you're just doing it because you want to try and, you know, don't, you don't want to lose the, the historic parts of Old Trap, but I'm not, I'm not sure that's a particularly good idea. I mean, look at White Hart Lane, look at Highbury. I don't think the fans of Arsenal are top of them. I particularly upset the fact that the, those old stadiums are no longer exist um, as, as they did before. Um, so I think just to just to do that for the heritage factor, I think is a big risk. If they can make a sort of a, a business proposition that works, then it is a good idea. But I do think it's risky. Yeah, Charlie just said, Martin, that this is an example of Ineos getting the big calls right. Would you agree with that? Um. Yeah, I, I, I think that it's a guess and a wait and see. Um, I think it's a very difficult one, the whole state. The whole stadium thing is a very difficult one. 
Ineos have been talking about. They initially talked about they wanted, you know, public funding to help them rebuild it, and they've had to sort of row back and that and just have it around the transport links for, for old traffic. Um, so I think it's really difficult. I mean, the Seb Clare is, is the person, I think, who's uh, in charge of the stadium project team. Um, he's the guy who actually decided having a, an Olympic stadium um, without a, a football legacy plan. So, yeah, he, I think he's somebody who's had mis made mistakes in the past. Let's hope he doesn't make another one. Right, OK. Let's move on now to a few transfer stories in the papers as well. We're going to focus on one in the Times. It's Liverpool eyeing up Spanish star Zubimendi. Liverpool are confident of securing a move for Martin Zubimendi, who has a £51 million release clause. Now, he came on to replace Rodri in the Euro final. He shone when he came on. Charlie, is this a good move, would you say? I think it'd be a good move. I know Liverpool fans have been frustrated that they've not signed anyone, but... The message has been, you know, quality over quantity. Uh, he's a holding midfielder. It's a position they haven't really sorted out properly since Fabinho left. Uh, Endo came in last summer. Uh, he did OK, uh, but he, he's not really uh, to the standard that Liverpool need if they're going to start winning things again. Um, so uh, I, I think, yeah, it cost £51 million from Real Sociedad. Uh, he's... I think he's open to the move, uh, but I think there's some way to go on it. But Liverpool have clearly identified him uh, and it would be, uh, yeah, a, a good transfer. And, you know, Liverpool don't make many bad moves in the in the, in the the transfer market. Well, certainly Jurgen Klopp didn't, but Michael Edwards is back there uh, involved in the transfers. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I, I expect them to get this one right. What do you think, Martin? Is this the player Liverpool need? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, after the first up, I knew of him, but I didn't know a lot about him before the, the Euros. Um, and when Rodri went off injured, I think like a lot of the people, I thought, well, this is a this, this can be really diff difficult for Spain, actually. They actually looked better when Zuba Mendigut came on and, and um, he played brilliantly. Um, now he, he's you know playing in, in the Spanish league in that holding midfield position. I think you have to be very good. Um, and clearly he is. And as Charlie said, Liverpool could do with somebody of, of that stature. Martin, Charlie, great to have you on back pages tonight. We'll see you again very soon on a day where there was disappointment for Matthew Hudson-Smith, pipped on the finish line of the 400 metres.